kind of important. Um, one is that I assigned a problem that the book, it, the, from the book that's actually wrong. That I don't mean I assigned one I didn't mean to assign, I mean the statement is incorrect. Um, so I want to talk about that really quickly. It's a very subtle thing, but some of you probably would have noticed it. Somebody already pointed this out to me. Um, so, number uh, three in section 2.4. Uh, and it's a very cool, easy fix. I still want you to do the problem. It's just the way it's stated is not correct. So this says that uh, if D is a common divisor of A and B, then D is the GCD of A and B if and only if the GCD of A over D and B over D is 1. Well, the problem is if anyone has their book open, you'll, you, you can follow along here. But um, So the problem is that if D happens to not be positive, then D certainly can't be the GCD of A and B because the, by definition the GCD is positive. So D, if D happens to be a negative divisor of A and B, then the statement's false. For example, if D is minus 1, not true, right? Um, so that's the easiest example. Minus 1 is certainly a common divisor of A and B, right? Minus 1 divides everything. But minus 1 can't be the GCD because it's negative. So how do you fix it? The assumption now is that D is a common positive divisor of A and B. Then it's true. But if it's not positive, it's, the statement is false. You guys clear on this? So let me just restate this. 2, 4, number 3. Insert the word positive between common and divisor. That's the best way I can say it. So the, the, the yeah. Is everybody okay with this? But you do have to insert that word. If, if not, it's, it is not true. It's definitely false. Right, but what I'm saying is it's possible for the GCD of, for example, suppose A, B were both 1 and D was minus 1. Then the GCD of A over D and B over D would be 1, but minus 1 is not the GCD of A and B. So it's true that the GCD has to be positive, but the other implication, if the GCD of A over D and B over D is 1, that does not imply that D is the GCD of A and B. That implication is false if D is not assumed to be positive. So anyways, yeah, you have to, you have to fix that, but just... With that in there, everything works out fine. Okay. Um, second thing, so I have good news and bad news. Um, the bad news I think most of you probably won't really care that much about, but um, bad news is that I don't have the homework done. The good news, the good news will outweigh the bad news. The good news is that uh, you're, I'm going to extend your, your uh, due date for the next assignment to Thursday. Okay. So, yeah. Both of them, both of them. And the reason is that um, I have to go up to Boulder to give a talk on Tuesday, so I'm not going to be here. Now, you do have class, okay? You do have class. Sorry, but you do have class. Um, <laughs> but I, yeah. The, James Parmenter, do you know who that is? Yeah, he's pretty good. You'll like him more than me, for sure. Um, he's got, he's got, he looks like he has lamb chops on the side of his face. He's got these big, uh, he kind of looks like Elvis a little bit. Uh, I call him Lamb Boy. Uh, so you, I'm sure he would be happy if you all address him as lamb boy. Um, so, yeah, but it's but you do have class on Tuesday. Yes. Do you have any? Um, like, is our next exam already scheduled? Oh yeah, it is, and I'm going to keep the scheduling of the next test the same, which actually is going to work out in your favor, really, because there's going to be less material on it. So, um, yeah, the next exam is coming up here before too long. The next exam is in two weeks, actually, from today. It's right. It's before spring break. So you can get nice and depressed before you go to Florida. Uh, yes, it's the 21st. Yeah, it's the 21st. And that I really sort of have to keep, I don't want to push it back after spring break. If I put it to the Tuesday after spring break, that, I mean, that could be good for some people, but disastrous for, for other people. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep it on uh, that date. Yeah, I think it's best to keep it that way. OK. Um, and the last thing I want to say before we get started, I'm wasting a lot of time as usual here, but um, last thing I want to say is just a couple things about the exam. Of course, the solutions are posted online. Some of you maybe have, have checked that out. I would definitely encourage you um, to, to look at the solutions online. They're, they're up there. They're on the, um, full, so they're on the, on the web page. It's on the syllabus. And if you, if, if you lost it, I mean, you can, all you have to do is go on Google. Just, just Google my, if you remember my name, Greg Oman. Um, go on the math department web page, and you, you can, you just click, click, click. You'll find it. Yeah, it's not on. It's definitely not on Blackboard. My, I have my own web page aside from Blackboard. Blackboard crashes like every three semesters. It crashes, and I just don't want to risk it anymore. So, um, but yeah, it's up there. You'll find it. You'll find it. Um, two things I want to make uh, comments about real quick. Um, one, this is still happening a lot. I know I wrote this on some of your your exams. Um, 
a lot of you are still, this isn't a, a hugely bad mistake, but it's, you know, it's something you should be paying attention to. A lot of you, when you're writing down your, your, your variables, you know, um, you're not specifying where they live. So some of you might say, okay, well, one's the GCD of A and B, therefore one is equal to X A plus Y B. Really, you should be saying one is equal to X A plus Y B for some integers, X and Y. Okay? It's, again, the same, remember what I said before about the pronoun, if I came up to you and said it is cold, I didn't tell you what it was? Okay, that's what you're doing when you do this. You're, you're, you're not saying what they are. You should say, again, you should be writing this clearly for some, the benefit of somebody who, who doesn't know what's going on. I know probably that you, you think that they're, that they're integers, but hang on one second. Some of you, depending, here's the other problem, here's the other reason why I like to see it, is that um, some of you are not sure what these things actually are. So if you don't specify, I don't know if you know or not for sure. Um, some, I think some of you are, are saying things like, oh, x divides y because I know that x times some real number is equal to y, therefore x divides y. Well, no, if that real number is not an integer, it doesn't count. That's why I'm also looking for this, because I, I need to know if you know what you're doing or not. If you don't tell me, I don't know if you know. Yeah? Okay, I've got a question. Mm -hmm. Say on the... I am listening to you, by the way. First uh, principle of finite induction. Mm -hmm. If we're saying that s is a set of positive integers, mm -hmm. And I go to say that in my second one, if k is an element of s, uh -huh. does that kind of imply yes, that definitely. Is, yes. Or must be a positive integer? Yes. Answer? Yes. Yes. Great. So, although the book definitely says k, where k is mm. an integer. Mm -hmm. Well, no. If you, if you say if you no if if you say something like that, you've already said okay, s is a subset of n, and k is an s. Well, then I know that it's an integer, for sure. If you have, I mean, if you have a question about your exam, we can talk about it after class. Okay. All right. So, um, yeah, everything's still the same. The, the homework is just due on, on Thursday. And uh, like I said, you will have class on Tuesday. Um, here is what we're going to do. So we proved a bunch of these lemmas and, and such about the primes. And that's sort of a setup to prove the, this main theorem of the section, which I want to get through today. Um, it's called, again, the, the fundamental theorem of, of uh, arithmetic. So before we do that, we're going to kind of do half of it now. Let's try this. Okay. There we go. That's a little better. Shut up. Okay. I'll tell you what. Let me, let me close. I'm just going to close this. Uh, I think it'll be okay. If it's if it gets really hot, then we'll open it up. We can. I mean, if, if if you get really hot, feel free to open it back up. I mean, I think it's just people waiting for the class to start. <clears throat> <laughs> wow, that was really scary. Uh, actually, I kind of like you to do that. Um, okay. This is something that you all know. Any integer n bigger than 1 is either prime or a product of primes. This is actually just part of it. I'm, I'm going to state the whole thing here in a minute, but yeah, this is this is sort of half of it, if you will. Um, well, it's what I know it as. Okay. Yeah. There, there's another. The, the other part of it's actually a little harder, but um, we'll talk about that here in a second. Okay. So this, you, you know, you've all. I don't know. Again, I'm old. Maybe you don't do this anymore, but maybe way back, you know, in sixth, seventh, eighth grade, something like that, you you had problems that said, you know. 100, here's the number 168, write it as, uh, you know, write the prime factorization of this, right? And you have a little tree where you break it into these things and then you just, you know, wherever you, you can't go any further, those are the primes and then you multiply everything together, right? Um, so you all do sort of have experience that suggests that this is probably true. Um, and it is. Of course, we're not going to do that. We're going to actually try to write a, a formal proof of this. Um, and as it turns out, it's, it's really not, not too bad. Um, let's suppose that this statement is false. Let's suppose not. Okay? 
Um, what we're going to do is we're going to let S be the set of all okay, positive integers n bigger than 1 such that n is not, I'll underline this, not prime and n is not a product of primes. Okay. So what can we say? Well, we're trying to prove that every integer bigger than 1 is a prime or a product of prime. So suppose, we're supposing that's false. We're going to try to get a contradiction. If it's not the case, then that means there has to be an integer that's not prime and also not a product of primes. If it's not true, that means there's a counterexample. There's something that's not prime and not a product of prime. So that means that S is non-empty, right? By our, by our assumption. We're trying to get a contradiction by our assumption that S is not empty. Okay. And the reason why S isn't empty, again, is just because we're assuming, we're essentially, we're just assuming it's not empty and we're going to try to find a contradiction. <clears throat> so what can we do? Well, if we have a non-empty set, Everything in S is certainly a natural number, right? It's, I, I didn't say, okay, I committed this sin that I was yelling at you about before, but this is a positive integer. I just got lazy. Uh, I'll, I'll, when, I, when I get lazy, I'll tell you I'm getting lazy. Okay? N is bigger than 1. It's not a prime. N is not a product of prime. So everything in S is a natural number. Everything in S is a, is a positive integer. Right? So what can we say? There's a property we learned about the positive integers here. We have a non-empty set of positive integers. What do we know about it? has a least element, right? Well-ordering property, right? We'll call it N, say, okay? Well, um, Here's my question. So n is an element of s. Look at the definition of s. Okay, it's a set of all uh, integers n bigger than one with with two properties. Right? Um, is n prime? Can n be prime? It's an element of s, right? So it means it has to satisfy that whatever condition is imposed on s. So n is certainly not prime, right? The members of s are the elements that are not prime and not products of primes. So n is certainly not prime, just by definition of s. Okay, so what can we say about n? And this is why I proved this, this silly lemma in the beginning. Uh, Joe? Um, this might be completely off, but we have to, it means that the only thing n can be is 1. Well, ultimately, that's true. That is ultimately where we're going to go with this, yes. Um, for, but, but we need to get a contradiction at some point that, sh that, that proves that n has to be 1. But yes, you're right. You, you are right. Uh, I mean, but the point is, though, that we can't say that just yet. We need to get a contradiction that forces that on us. And we're going to, we'll, we, you'll see here in a second. Okay, so if you go back to lemma one, what did lemma one say? If we have a, a number or an integer n bigger than one that's not prime, right? I showed, I, I showed you that it has to be a product of two things that are strictly between one and itself, right? That's what we did in the very beginning of, of class, I think, right, on Tuesday. Okay, so n is Rs. For some integers, Rs satisfying 
one less than r, less than n, and one less than s, less than n. Uh, again, it's just straight from lemma one. Okay, so n was the least element of s, right? r and s are both less than n, so r and s cannot be in s because n was the least one and they're smaller, so they're not in s, right? Make sense? Okay. Again, try to try to follow this. Some of these ideas are going to come up a little bit in, in your homework, and certainly in problems that are going to come up later. So, it really, if you, it's, it's going to help you just to try to try to follow the argument. Um, so, what can we say about R and S? Um, thus, okay, this goes back to some logic. Maybe you did this in discrete. If R is when R is definitely bigger than one, right? So, if it's not an S, then this condition about applied to R can't be true, right? If it were, it'd be, it would be an S. So what can we say about R? If R is bigger than 1 but not in S. Anybody tell me? Joe? It's either a prime or a product. Of prime. Exactly, yes. Exactly right. Okay? The members of S are uh, both prime, uh, sorry, are not, not prime and not a product of prime. So if that's not the case, you negate that, it becomes an element that's not an S is either prime or a product of primes. It's one of the two. It's got to be prime or a product of primes. If it's neither, then that's exactly what S is saying, right? If it's neither. So, R is prime or a product of primes. Can we say the same thing about S? Yeah, because S is also not in capital, little s, I should say. It's not in capital S, so the same thing's true of little s, right? Okay, now, here's the punchline. Remember what N was, right? N is equal to R times S. What can we say about n? So r is either prime or a product of primes, s is either prime or a product of primes, and n is r times s. So, so n, what can we say about n? Well, it's, you can say even, even something more specific than that. n is a product of primes, because it's a product of two things. If those guys were both prime, then n is still a product of primes, because it's got two of them, right? So n is definitely a product of primes, and that contradicts the fact that it's an S, right? It's not a prime, and it's not a product of primes. There's your contradiction. Theorem's proven now. Okay, so this contradiction then uh, proves the proposition. This is how proof by contradiction goes, right? You assume wh whatever it is you're trying to prove, assume it's false and get something, get both statement P and statement not P, which is of course impossible. Therefore, you conclude that your original statement had to be true. Okay. Okay. And then there was another technical lemma, which is just more work than it's worth. And I, I think I'm just going to skip it and I'm just going to trust that you'll just believe it. Um, otherwise, I may not get through all this today. So, the book doesn't do it either. The book doesn't do it either. I'm just trying to be as rigorous as possible. But I, sometimes time is more important than than rigor. <laughs> so, I uh, I'm going to skip this, and I'll just you will all be convinced that it's true, anyways. Um, okay. And so there's just one other thing we have to talk about, and then we'll just go into the the last part of the proof. 
And then again, I want to at least spend about 10 minutes or so talking about homework um, since I won't be here on Tuesday. Okay. Everybody uh, copy this down? No? Okay. All right. I think, and I, I, I left out a couple of things here, so somebody please tell me if this is not right. I think we're on definition three now. So I'm pretty sure I defined prime and composite, and now we're on three. Somebody can tell me if that's wrong. It's definition two that we're on? Okay. Let's see. No, it's, I think it is three, right? Okay. So let n bigger than one be an integer or a natural number. They're equivalent in this case. Okay, and let's say that n can be written as a product of primes in canonical form. if n is equal to p1 to the alpha 1, p2 to the alpha 2, on down to, say, pk to the alpha k, where p1 is less than p2, which is less than p3, on down. So basically the primes are in it, uh, listed in increasing order. And each of these exponents, each of these alpha sub i's are natural numbers, positive integers. Okay, and so this is just sort of Canonical just in this in mathematics really just sort of means natural. That's the way you interpret this. It just means you're just writing, you're grouping all the primes together, and then you're just going up in increasing order. And so I want to make an observation here that I'm not going to prove. And and this is just something that we could try to prove, but again, the amount of work that would go into it is just not cannot it just doesn't justify. Uh, let me say it a better way. It's just not justified because this would be transparently clear to you um, that 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 this is this is certainly the case. Um, any integer n bigger than one that can be written as a product of primes. can be so written in canonical form. Okay, and again, I, I'm not going to write a proof of this, but I just want to give you the idea. What's the idea? The idea is just all the primes you see, just group them all together, and then just do it so that you're going in increasing order. That, that's it. So in this case, right, what we want is 2 squared times 3 squared times 5 times 7. The right side is in canonical form. Okay. Do you guys all buy that? You just have a bunch of products of primes, just group them like this, and you can certainly get canonical form very easily. 
I don't think I need to write a proof, a formal proof of this. This is just obvious that you can do this. Okay. Hopefully this is obvious. This example made it obvious. What's that? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, more, more or less. Um, <laughs> well, the, the proof, the, technically the proof would be by induction on the number of primes in the product, but I'm not going to do it. I just don't want to. So, um, yeah. You say, well, if, n is, if there's only one prime, well, there's nothing to do. Suppose that it's true for n primes, then you have n plus one of them, and then you, you just basically say, okay, well, let me just um, look at all the, the first n ones. Well, we can write that in canonical form, and then just the other guy, if, wherever it is, you just slide it into the right spot. I mean, that's really all the proof amounts to. So, yeah. Okay. Um, I think that's about all I want to say here. Um, where am I going? Where am I going? Okay. All right. I'm going to do, okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. So this is the last thing that I'm going to do uh, is just the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. So we'll do that now. And we should definitely have time to talk about a couple of homework problems before we leave. So, okay. All right. Everybody have this down now? Okay. Let me go ahead and start a new page here. Okay. So this is the main, you know, this is sort of the, the main point of the section here. So let me, let me start up here. All right. Fundamental theorem of arithmetic. And yeah, this actually has applications. It seems like, you know, I learned this in fifth grade, but um, there, there are some, some applications of this that allow you to do things that are not as obvious as you might think. We'll get into some of that later. Okay. And the statement's very simple, but I, I'm going to need to explain exactly what this means. Every integer n bigger than 1 can be written uniquely. That's the key. And this unique part is actually important. It really allows you to prove some other theorems about irrationality of square roots and things like that. Um, I'm getting ahead of myself, but um, written uniquely in only one way in um, canonical form. Okay, I should have put this canonical form at the end, but that's okay. As a product of primes. And there is something I definitely need to clarify here. Some of you might object and say, no, 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 that is not true. And depending on how you interpret this, you're right. And that's why I need to make a clarification. And this is just the way it's done in mathematics. There's a little fudging going on here. But um, product of primes, you might say, well, what about 5? Five? Five's just a prime. It's not a product of primes. Five's an integer bigger than 1, but it's just a prime by itself. It's not a product of anything. Well, when we say product of primes, we, we mean the product could just include one thing. Okay, so you have to be very, be aware of that. I really want to impress that upon you. Product of primes, five by itself, we include as a product of primes. It's sort of a trivial product, if you will, in the sense, or a degenerate product, in the sense that there's only one guy there. But that's something you should be aware of, okay? Okay, so here is the proof. And it turns out the proof is actually not that hard. It's, I mean, we have to do a few things here, but it's, it's not that bad. Um, I think you should be able to follow this. Okay, so by Proposition 1, uh, did I label this observation as Observation 1? Okay, I'll just say, okay, well, let me just say Observation. Um, Every integer n bigger than 1 can be written as a product of primes in canonical form.
Okay. Right? Proposition 1 said that every integer n bigger than 1 is a product of primes. And remember, the observation says that if we get a product of primes, we can always put it into canonical form. So if we combine these together, then we know that every integer n bigger than 1 can be written as a product of primes in canonical form. The only other thing we have to prove is that it's unique. This is going to require a little bit of work, um, but, it's, but it's not that compl It's really not that hard, though. Um, <clears throat> no, actually, we can just do this directly, more or less. Um, you might be able to do that, too. Um, I just was told that that's kind of the go-to one for you. Oh. Um, it depends. It really does depend. Um, and certainly it's possible that you could write a very natural proof that way here, too. I'm just not going to do it that way. Okay, so the question here, this is the kind of the complicated part, is well, what does that even mean, uniqueness, okay? What does it mean to be able to be written uniquely in canonical form? And I'll, t I'll tell you what it means. And if you follow this, try to follow this along, I think you'll, you'll be okay. So let's suppose that... Okay, so there's going to be a lot of symbols here, but um, P1 to the alpha 1, P2 to the alpha 2 on down to pk to the alpha k is equal to, um, oops, I can fix this, okay, q1 to the beta 1, q2, hopefully my bad handwriting isn't going to screw this up too badly, to the beta 2 um, on down to qn to the beta n. And I'll put an asterisk next to this because we're going to refer to this again multiple times. Okay, can you guys all read that? Beta 1, beta 2. If you just want to write Bs, that's fine too. But really, I'm, I'm intending this to be the letter beta. Okay. Seriously, can you guys read this? Is this okay? Okay. Um, well, let me specify exactly what this means. Where 1 each exponent alpha i and beta i, all of these guys are natural numbers. These are all positive integers, right? Two, each p sub i and q sub i is prime. Three P one is less than P two, which is less than dot dot dot, which is less than PK. Right? And four. Same thing is true for the Q's. Q one is less than Q two, is less than on down to Q N. Okay. I'm gonna try to squeeze this all on, on one uh, slide here. Sorry for being a little sloppy here. What is it that we have to prove? I, I want you guys to think about this. Okay, so before I say, you see what I've, I've got here? What this says is really just that this is a product of primes in canonical form, and this is a product of primes in canonical form. Right? That's what all this is saying, really. And if I want every integer n bigger than 1 to have a unique expression as a product of primes in canonical, in canonical form. I really mean that these should all be look exactly the same. And so the point I want to make first is let's try to enunciate that. Let's try to clarify what that. What does that mean that, it's, that those expressions are exactly the same? There are several things. Actually, there are three things that we need to know. Okay, so if those expressions, and this is what I want you to think about, if those two sides have to look exactly alike, what has to be true? Can anybody tell me one thing that has to be true? Yes, that's true. That's true. I'm going to write that down in a second. Yeah, that's exactly right. All the exponents have to be the same. And the other thing, this I'm going to write down first because this is the easiest one to prove. K and N have to be the same. There have to be the same number of primes. right? So let me just say it all and I'll write it down. N and K have to be the same. They have to be the same number of primes on the left as on the right. 
Each of the corresponding primes have to be the same. P1 and Q1 have to be the same. P2 and Q2 have to be the same, et cetera. And all the corresponding powers have to be the same. Then those two expressions will, look ex will be identical, right? So those are the three things we need to prove. You guys with me here? Okay. All right, so that's what we're going to do. So the first thing we're going to prove is that K, in fact, is equal to N. The second thing we'll prove is that um, these P's and Q's, the corresponding P's and Q's are the same. PI is equal to QI um, for any I between 1 and N. And remember, after we've proven 1, K and N are the same. So I can pick either N or K. It's the same thing, right? And the third is that the corresponding powers have to be the same. And then we certainly have the exact same expression on both sides. Okay. So that is our goal. So we're just going to establish these three things. And it's not as hard as, as you might think. It's really not that bad. Then we'll be done with this section. Okay. We okay here? Anyone need more time? Okay. All right. So let's do one first. So what we're going to do is we're going to let A be the set of the primes with, with P, right? So A is going to be P1, P2, on down to PK. And we're going to let B be the Q primes, right? Q1, Q2, down to Q sub N. And we're going to show that A is equal to B. These two sets are the same. So I want to I want to be clear about this. Suppose you know the two sets are the same. Well, then K and N are automatically have to be equal because if the sets are the same, this is, whatever number of elements you have in one set has to be the same as the number of elements in the other set because they're the same set, right? So we get K equal to N for free if we do that. We're actually going to get a little more than that too, but that's the idea. So do you remember maybe from discrete how you show that two sets are equal? What do you do, Joe? You prove that A is a subset of B. B is yes, that's right. That's right. And that is something if if you took discrete. If you had a reasonable instructor for this class, you should have been exposed to that before. Okay, so we're just going to do one direction because the other direction follows the same way, and I don't want to spend the time on class doing exactly the same argument again. But well, I'll show you that A is a subset of B, and then B has to be a subset of A for the same reason. Okay, so so how do you do this? So you pick an arbitrary element of A, right? Pick any. We'll, we'll just say P sub I, right? P sub I in A. And we're, I'm going to suppress this for time. We're going to show that P sub I is in B. That's what we're going to do, okay? Uh, this is in your notes. I, I'm not going to flip back now. But the star, uh, the start equation was just that those two products of primes were equal, right? Just the P sub I's to these powers equals the Q sub I's to these powers. By star, we know that P sub I divides... Q1 to the beta 1 dot 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 on down to Qn to the beta n, right? If you look back in your notes to that start equation, you guys should buy that, right? Because P1 times something is certainly equal to that right side. So P1 divides it. Hopefully that's not too much of a stretch here. Um, you guys all buy that? If you look at the equation, right? P1 times something is the, le the right-hand side. So by, um, let's see... By corollary one, I'll remind you what this is in a second. Okay, corollary one. You can look back in this in your notes. But corollary one was was the corollary that said it, if prime divides a product of a bunch of integers, then that prime has to divide one of the integers in the product. Okay, so if this prime divides a product of a bunch of, of these, here's the way I want you to think about it. Okay, imagine actually writing instead of q1 to the beta one, just write q1 times itself, beta one times. And the same thing with Q2 and the same thing on down. So you have all these primes written out. So since PI divides that whole product, PI has to divide one of those primes. 
not just one of the primes to a power. It has to actually divide one of those primes if you write them all out. It's a product of a bunch of integers. The prime has to divide one of them. That doesn't mean any one of them, right? No, it doesn't. It just means it has to divide some of them. Yes, it has to divide some one of them. Yeah. So by corollary one, P sub I divides, say, Q sub J, right? For some J uh, with 1 less than or equal to J less than or equal to N. Okay. Any questions about this? Do you guys see where I'm, I'm saying this? It's not, it's not just that it'll divide some QI to a power. If, well, if it divides that to a power, then just write them all out. Then it has to divide that one guy too. Okay. So then what can we say about this? Um, well, there's also a lemma I proved specifically for this because I knew it was coming. Um, I think it was lemma two. Lemma two said that um, if a prime divides another prime, they have to be equal. Okay, that's something else we did on Tuesday. So we know that P sub I has to actually be equal to Q sub J because they're prime. Thus, Tell me if you believe this. Thus, P sub I is an element of B, right? It's equal to something in B. It's got to be in B. And, of course, the exact same sort of reflected argument applies to show that B is a subset of A. It's exactly the same argument, right? Yeah. Are we assuming that J is an element? Yes, yes. Uh, so, again, when I'm doing this, I will get, I will be just slightly lazy from time to time because... Um, Time. Well, yeah, but yeah, J's J's definitely an integer. Yes. Similar, right? Okay, so A is equal to B. And if A and B are equal, then they have the same number of elements, and therefore K has to be equal to N. That was the first thing we needed to show. Okay. Okay, the second case, I'm not, there's really not much to say here. So the second thing we need to show is that um, each of these PIs and QIs are the same. Okay, this is the one I was going to prove a lemma before this, but I decided not to. Um, actually, I'll tell you what. Let me, uh, let me go, go back here for a second. Okay. And this is the thing that I'm hoping you guys will just take on faith because of time. The P's are listed in increasing order. That's the assumption. The Q's are in increasing order. But if the, the set of the P's and the set of the Q's are the same and they're listed in increasing order, then the corresponding ones have to match up. They have to, right? If they don't, I mean, the smallest one has to correspond to the smallest one. If it's off at all, then, right, then you, you can't, well, basically, you're going to get a contradiction if, 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 if it's skewed in any way. So since the sets are the same and they're in increasing order, it all has to line up. So all the P's and Q's have to be equal to each other. Okay, the corresponding P's and Q's have to be the same. Like I said, I was going to prove a lemma that proved this rigorously, but I just don't have time to do that. Okay. <clears throat> so, P-I equals Q-I, that's an I, sorry, for any I between 1 and N by... Um, the proof of one. Okay. In general, if two sets are equal and you have them written this way, they don't have to match up. Because, for example, the set one, two, and the set two, the set one, comma, two, and the set two, comma, one are the same. There's no order built into the sets. But one and two aren't equal. But if they're listed both in increasing order, then they have to be the same. That's the point. Okay. So we've got uh, two things done. We just have one more thing to do. Okay. So the last thing we have to prove is that the, the corresponding exponents have to be the same. 
Okay, so that's what we're going to try to prove. So we now have by 1 and 2. Let me put a star next to this. P1 to the alpha 1, P2 to the alpha 2, Pn to the alpha n is equal to P1 to the beta 1, P2 to the beta 2, on down to Pn to the beta n. Okay, and why am, I, why am I doing this? Well, this just goes back to the original equation that I put an asterisk next to. We've already proven that the number of primes on either side are the same, so we can just use n on both of them, because n and k are the same, and we know that the corresponding primes are also the same. That's why on the right side I can replace each qi with pi, because we know that they all are the same. We just proved that, right? So what is it that we have left to prove? We need to know that alpha 1 equals beta 1, alpha 2 equals beta 2, etc., and then they, we know that they look exactly the same at that point. Okay, so, yeah. This is the last thing we're going to do. All right. And again, for the sake of time, I'm just going to prove that, and also for simplicity, I'm just going to show you that, the, that alpha 1 is equal to beta 1. And then it's, it's just automatically, it's just automatic that all the other powers have to be the same. Why is that? Because you, the order doesn't matter. You can all, I mean, well, okay, at this point the order doesn't matter. You can just, the P2 to the, to the alpha 2 and the P2 to the beta 2, well then just, because multiplication is commutative, just flip those to the front and then just run the same argument again. Okay, so then you can just get it for everything for free after that. Okay, and again, I'm doing this now just because I don't want to say let it, we're going to prove alpha i equals beta i, and then it just gets messier. So let's just do it for the first one, and you'll see the idea. Okay. Um, now here's where, okay, we actually are going to use a, a contradiction here. But um, let's suppose not. Then if they're not the same, then either... Alpha 1 is less than beta 1, or beta 1 is less than alpha 1, right? Let's suppose that alpha 1 is less than beta 1. The same proof is going to work the other way. I mean, if beta 1 was less than alpha 1, it's the same exact proof. then all we're going to do is divide, oops, sorry, all right, uh, I'll tell you what, I'm just getting sick of erasing stuff. Okay, so this is in your notes if you're copying it. I just put this equation star. Um, you can look in your notes to see this equation. We're going to divide everything, both sides, by P1 to the alpha 1. That's what we're going to get. Uh, that's what we're going to do. So then what happens on the left side when we divide by P1 to the alpha 1? Well, it just cancels out, right? It's gone. And then we just have P2 to the alpha 2, et cetera, on the left-hand side. You guys see this from your notes? Yeah? Okay. P2 to the alpha 2 times P3 to the alpha 3 on down to Pn to the alpha n equals, and what do we get on the right side? What's the first, what, what is P1, what, what is the new power on P1 on the right side? Beta 1 minus alpha 1, right? You guys see that? Dividing through by P1 to the alpha 1, we have, well, when you have the same base, you subtract the, the power. So it's, we just subtract the power from it, and then we get everything else to being the same. Okay, 
right? And now we're, we're basically done. Here's what, here's what we have, okay? We're basically just going to, to reuse the proof of, of one to get a contradiction here. And I'll just say what it is first, and then you can write it down if you want, if you don't want to wait for me to write it on, on the screen. What did we prove in the first, uh, for the first part of, of this um, uniqueness proof? We proved that if you have a product of primes written in canonical form equal to another product of primes in canonical form, then the set of primes are the same. We proved that. That's exactly what we proved. Now you see what we have? We have a set of, we have a two, uh, these, these are both in canonical form, right? They're still increasing. Even though we're missing P1, P2 to 3N, is, P, PN is still increasing. So we have a product of primes in canonical form on the left equal to a product of, of primes in canonical form on the right, but the sets of primes are not the same because P1's missing now. That contradicts the first thing we proved, that the, the set of primes is the same. Okay? And therefore, alpha 1 and beta 1 have to be equal. And then you apply the same argument to all the powers. It's the same thing. Hopefully you guys are with me on this, okay? Can't have this. This is what we, the first thing we proved is that the set of primes is the same. If you have two primes, in, uh, products of primes in canonical form, they have to be the same. We have two primes equal in canonical form. The sets of primes are the same, but they're not. There's a contradiction. This is false. And if you want to, just to totally nip this in the bud here, why, is it, why are these not the same? Because P1 is in this set, but it's not in that set. They can't be the same because they don't have the same members. Okay? So the conclusion is that our assumption, our contradictory uh, assumption is actually, it leads to a contradiction. And thus, um, these powers uh, actually do have to be the same. And similarly... powers all match up. Alpha I equals beta I for all I satisfying 1 less than or equal to I less than or equal to N. And that's it. That's the proof. So we've established existence of the product of an integer bigger than 1 as a product of primes in canonical form and that any two such expressions have to be the same. Okay. And I told you, and this is good, and now we actually have a little more time this time, so I didn't babble uh, on as long as I usually do. Um, definitely want to take this, this time. This will be good for you, too, to talk about a couple of homework problems, okay? Um, I can tell you right now, because I just, I think I have a pretty good sense of what is, people find tricky and what they don't. Um, 2.4, number 6, is going to cause some trouble, okay? Um, I'm going to give you a, I'm actually going to give you more than a hint. I'm going to give you kind of a road map as to how you can go about trying to do number six. Okay. Um, and I'll write it down for you. Okay, so, we're, so this is it. This is the end of the section. And so we are done now. So homework. I don't know how, if any of you have actually looked at number six yet. Maybe it's not due till, well, now it's a week from today, but. Okay, good. That that tells me that you have actually some idea of what you're doing because. Uh, I started googling it because like I'll start it and I don't really get anywhere and I found okay. like a bajillion different ways to go about it. Uh, you just wrecked the whole class by saying that now. Oh, wow. Everyone's going on Google to get their homework solutions. Yeah, but it doesn't make any sense. So okay. They can all go Google all they want. It's it's a thing to go to Google to write down the answer to your homework problem. It's not a thing to recite it on the test. Yeah. Well, for yeah, that's true. The question is like they did. Like the AX plus BY equals one thing, but then they squared both sides. What does that do? Okay. Um, What's the point of squaring both sides? Well, okay. Um, MIT guy did. Yeah, so there's, there's, uh, there are several ways you can go about doing this. Um, I'm going to do it. I'm going to, okay. In general, 
there is not just one way to do a proof. There are multiple ways to do a proof. Some of them, and sometimes you might have a proof that's short but kind of masks the idea, so you're kind of left with going, well, how did you even come up with this? And some of them are a little bit longer, but they're clearer to understand. This one is, is going to be maybe a little bit longer, although it's actually not that long. Um, but I think it's, it's much less, it's actually a little bit less messy maybe than what you're talking about. I'm not sure exactly. I have an idea of probably where he was going with it, but um, here's, okay. So this is, let me just write down the problem first, okay? 2, 4, number 6 it says to prove, and I'm going to abbreviate this. You really shouldn't do this in your proofs. I'm, I'm just doing this now to save some, some time to actually talk about this problem. If the GCD of A and B is 1, then prove that the GCD of um, A plus B and A times B is equal to 1. If, so the problem says, it basically says, assume the GCD of A and B is 1. So in other words, A and B are relatively prime. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, okay. So then what we're going to try to, you need to prove is that the GCD of A plus B and AB is 1. Now I can tell you this. If you just try to go through it by the definition, or if you, okay, so let me just give you a couple of ideas first. There's a theorem that said, if you know that, that some integer linear combinations of two, uh, linear combination of two integers is 1, then those two integers have GCD equal to 1. Then they're relatively prime. So you might think, okay, well, I know that, that you know, xA plus yB equals 1 for some integers x and y, and I'll try to use that to somehow mess with that to get something times a plus b time, plus something times ab is 1, and then I'm done. Then I'm done. Mm -hmm. you, that is something you should probably be able to, to do, although I'm not going to go in that direction, actually. Um, I haven't even really thought about it. Okay. Um, it's, def it's going to probably require a little bit of cleverness and manipulation and such. And this does too a little bit, but I think maybe not as much. So it's not as mysterious where the solution's coming from. So I'm going to go, I'm going to kind of talk about it this way. This is a suggestion. This is not saying you have to do it. If you want to try to mess with this and do what I was just saying, and it's right, that's fine. I'm not saying this is the only way that you can do it. Okay? Um, here's here's uh, what I'm going to, going to um, suggest here. And, I, and I'm, I'm just going to write it exactly that way. Suggestion. Okay? Not have to, or only way, I'm not saying that. Um, let D be the GCD of A plus B and, a, and AB. And I also think this has the advantage of, of kind of getting you more familiar with some of the tools that are going to come up. You're going to, this is going to come up to a little bit in um, a homework problem I gave you in 3.1, which I'm also going to talk about here in a minute. Okay. Try to do this. And again, remember, that, that I'm just giving you a, a kind of a road map. I'm not going to tell you exactly how to do these, but I'm going to break it down into a bunch of smaller pieces that are, should be more manageable. Okay. First thing, one, prove that, uh, and you might want to do this on scratch paper first. Just make sure you have all the pieces together and then write a nice coherent argument in your, in your homework. Prove that D divides um, a squared minus b squared. I'll even give you a hint as to how you go about doing this. This may seem a little mysterious for now. Can anybody see how you might be able to pull this off? Anyone? You know that d divides a plus b for sure, right? This is a GCD. How, how can you show that it divides a squared minus b squared? Think about factoring. But so what, what is a squared minus b squared? It's, it's a plus b times a minus b. A plus okay. What, what's that? Oh, so, okay, so wait a minute. A squared minus b squared is a plus b times a minus b. I'm just going to say it for the sake of time. I'm not going to have time to write all this down. I want you to just pay attention to this. This is a plus b times a minus b. Most of you should know that, right? You already know that d divides a plus b. So d times x equals a plus b for some x. But then dx times a minus b is a plus b a minus b, which is a squared minus b squared. You see that? Did I do that too fast? d times x is a plus b because d divides a plus b. Multiply both sides by a minus b. Then d times something is a plus b a minus b, which is a squared minus b squared. Okay? Got it? Okay? There's the first thing. Two. Prove that d divides a squared plus b squared. 
This is not maybe as, as obvious. Yeah, it does. But in this case, it's a little trickier, though, because well, we don't know that d divides a, actually, right? Here's, here's the, the, the hint here. And you can write this down again. I'm not going to write all this down for you. But if you want to write it down, you can. How could we do this? Anybody, well, can anybody see? I'm only going to have a couple more minutes to do this. But anybody see how to do this? This may be a little trickier. Well, d divides, think about it. d divides a plus b. Say d times x equals a plus b. Then d times x times a plus b. Is a, so if d divides a plus b, then d divides a plus b squared, the whole quantity squared, that's for sure, right? Just multiply both sides by a plus b, and you get d divides a plus b squared. What is a plus b quantity squared? a squared plus 2ab plus b squared. But you, you've got an extra 2ab that you don't want. But you also know that d divides ab, so d is going to divide 2ab. So then you can get that extra term out of the way because you know that d divides that extra term. So then it's going to divide the difference, basically. d divides a squared plus... 2ab plus b squared. It also divides ab. So it divides 2ab. So it divides a squared plus 2ab plus b squared minus 2ab, which is exactly that. Write it down. If you want to, if you want to remember, just write it all down, what I'm saying right now. Write it down. OK? Now, once you've got this, you can prove that d divides 2a squared and d divides 2b squared. There's not much to this, by the way. Why do you want to do that? Well, you'll see. How, you, how can you get this? Subtract. If d divides something into something else, it also divides the difference. There's a theorem. I think it was theorem 2 part g uh, from section 2.2 .2 or something like that that says if d divides a and b, then it divides all linear combinations of a and b. Okay. So if it divides a, a squared plus b squared and d divides a squared minus b squared, it's going to divide their sum. What's their sum? 2a squared. Right? And you can do the same thing the other way to get 2b squared. So what do you know about d? d is going to divide the GCD of 2a squared and 2b squared, right? You buy that? If it divides both of them, it has to divide their, their greatest common divisor as well. That's part of the definition of GCD, right? It divides both, and anything that divides both divides the GCD. Now you can use some theorems that I proved in class. You can pull the two out. I'm not going to stop here, but you can pull out the two. That's something we did in class. And if the GCD of A and B is one, then the GCD of A squared and B squared is one by what I just told you yesterday. Remember one of the older problems that said it, we talked about yesterday, if GCD of A and B is one, then the GCD of A to the N and B to the N is one? You see, now you can get it, you can will it down to know that D has to be one or two. And then you have to rule out two, and then you're done. I'm warning you, you guys, you have to think in here. You have to think in here. And sometimes you have to be a little clever. There's just no way around it. That's the nature of the beast. That's what we do in, in this course. And so, you know... Hopefully, some of you are not doing this, and some of you have your heads down, and right now your head's spinning, and you wish you were dead. But hopefully, most of you are thinking that, you know, well, you worry about your grade, but you want to th think of these as, as, you know, puzzles. You want to figure these out, you know. I'm not saying you should be jumping up and down for joy, and you should spend every Friday and Saturday night doing this instead of going out and having fun. But that's, that's kind of the point of this, is to, is to think of this as a challenge, okay? Think of them as puzzles that you want to figure out. And so some of them get a little tricky. All right, well, I'll give you a lot of hints here. So this is one way you can, you can go with this problem, OK? All right, so let me talk about one more problem, then we'll finish up for the day. Uh, OK, I go to a new page now. Is that OK? This is another one that I think is going to cause some trouble. Um, 3.1. Number 8. Suppose that, uh, I'm, I'm going to kind of abbreviate this, but P is bigger than or equal to Q, and Q is bigger than or equal to 5. Um, P and Q are prime here. This is almost kind of a weird problem. You almost think that there's no way this is true. Then it is kind of surprising. Then 24, that's kind of a big number. 24 has to divide P squared minus Q squared. Okay. 
Well, yeah, it's. It seems I will. T it it does. It does seem random, but this is where I'm. Uh, and okay. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to collect my thoughts here. You, we're starting to get to a point in the course where we're just hammering on things from the just using the knowledge you came in with uh, to this course with is not going to work anymore. So some of you might think, well, how am I going to do this? I'll, I'll divide by 24 using the division algorithm. I'll have 24 cases or something like this. That's not going to work. You're going to have to be a little craftier than that to do some of these. And this is a perfect example of this. Um, here's my suggestion. I really want you guys to listen to this because this is going to maybe help you a little bit to just have an idea of where to start. A lot of you are going to see this problem, and it's okay because you just don't have a lot of experience yet. There's nothing wrong with this. Or you go, I have no idea what the hell to do. I have no idea how to start this. How am I going to prove 20 plus a weird number? How do I prove this? I have no idea. Um, well, think of it this way, okay? You think, well, I, maybe I can't do 24, but if 24 divides it, then certainly 2 has to. Maybe I can just prove that 2 divides it. Maybe, maybe I can prove that p squared minus q squared actually has to be even somehow. And I'm just going to talk this out first. I, want, I really want you guys to listen. This is going to help you. It really is. Well, how do I know? Okay, so two, if, if this is true, then 2 has to divide it. p squared minus q squared has to be even. Why? Why does it have to be even? Well, p and q are primes. So p and q, because they're bigger than or equal to 5, have to be odd. Because if they're even, 2 would divide into them. And that would contradict the fact that they're primes. You guys buy this? Can't be even. A prime bigger than 2 cannot be even. Because it can't have 2 as a factor. It only has 1 in itself as a factor. Okay. An odd, but then an odd number squared is still odd. This is a corollary of what you guys proved. Actually, some of you just proved the square of an odd number was odd, but that's not what I asked on the exam. But um, So an odd number squared is odd minus an odd number squared is odd. Odd minus odd is even. Bam, so now we've got two. So at least you're getting somewhere. This is what I'm saying. If you don't know how to do the full thing, break it into a sub-piece that you can handle. And then just keep breaking it up until you see kind of what's going on and then put it all together. That's kind of how you're, very roughly, what you're doing here. Okay, um, and I'm going to tell you here, this is huge. This will help you on this problem, and I, I think maybe another problem in this section too. This is really big. And from the notes, uh, let me make sure, no, I'm going to use the labeling the book does. For this section, I want you to be very aware of this corollary because this will help you, certainly will help you in this problem. I'm going to say it, you should all write this down. Corollary 2 on page 23. Corollary 2, page 23. And I want you to listen to what I'm saying. Okay, we only have five more minutes. I know it's been a while now. But this is what corollary 2 says. And I'll write some of this down in a second. But I want you, to listen, you guys to listen to this. Corollary 2 says if you know that A divides some number C and B divides some number C and A and B are relatively prime, then their product divides C. Listen to this. 24 is 8 times 3. 8 and 3 are definitely relatively prime. They don't have anything in common. So if you can prove that 8 divides p squared minus q squared, and you can prove that 3 divides p squared minus q squared, then by corollary uh, 2, since they're relatively prime, the product, which is 24, divides p squared minus q squared. So really, you can break this down into two subproblems that are easier to manage. Use that corollary to squish it together, and then you get the result. This is what I mean by you guys have to start thinking outside the box a little bit. You've got to start to be clever. Use the tools. Sometimes you have to use the tools, or you're not going to be able to solve the problem. Okay? So, the idea is to prove that 1, 8 divides p squared minus q squared, and 2, 3 divides p squared minus q squared. Now, I'll, I'll kind of get us started a little bit on 1, and then we'll stop. And, but with 3, you're going to do something similar, okay? Don't, and again, I'm, I'm just writing down, I'm just sketching the rough idea. I'm not trying to make this polished. Your proof should be a little more polished than this, okay? Well, what do we know about P and Q? Since they're odd primes, they are, um, well, the prime's bigger than two. They are odd. P and Q are both odd, okay? Again, you need to write down everything clearly. I'm just doing this for the sake of time. We know that P is equal to 2R plus 1, and we know that Q is equal to 2S plus 1 for some integers R and S, right? I'm not going to write all that out because I just don't have the time, but that we know. So what do we know about p squared minus q squared? Well, where can, how can we get somewhere with this? Um, in this case, you may not actually even need to, to do this, but I think, I think this is going to serve you well. This is p plus q times p minus q, right? 
Okay? You buy that? We just talked about that before. So what is this? This is 2R plus 1 plus 2S plus 1 times 2R plus 1 minus 2S plus 1, which just becomes minus 2S minus 1, right? You follow this? Okay? You should, in your proof, you should say something like, because P is a prime, it must be odd. You know, you should, you should justify why it, has to, why it can't be even. And what is this? Well, okay, I'm, I'm running out of time, so you see that I can pull out a 2? 1 plus 1 is 2, so I can just pull that out. And I just have R plus S plus 1 left over, right? Well, what do we have left in the second set of parentheses? This is just 2R minus 2S, right? You see that? Well, now what can we do? We can pull out another 2, right? So now this is 4 times R plus S plus 1 times R minus S. You see that? What do we want to prove? We want to prove that 8 divides it. Well, we are, we're, we're kind of close. We've got the 4 on the outside. What we really like is to have an 8 factored out, because then we know that 8 divides it, and then we're done, right? Well, what you want to do is look at what you've got left over. Listen to what I'm saying, and we're going to stop here in a minute. If you can prove that one of these, at least one of these guys is even, then you can pull a 2 out, and you've got your 8, okay? How do you do that? Well, just consider cases, right? Suppose that, for example, suppose R and S are both even, then R minus S is even, and you've got your 2. Suppose R and S are both odd, then R minus S is odd, and you've got your 2. You see that? You guys, you guys listening to this? hope you are. This is helping you, hopefully. Well, what's the last case? One's even and one's odd, right? If they're both even or both odd, that's even, and you've got what you want. Otherwise, one's even and one's odd. Well, what can you say? If one's even and one's odd, the sum of an even and an odd number is odd, right? But then the plus 1 makes it even, so then you got your even in that case, too. Right? You see that? You guys got to start. These are going to get a little more challenging. They're not going to be all like the induction proofs where they just work themselves out. You have to be a little clever. And then you can do something similar with 3. What's the remainder? When you, if you divided P by 3, what's the remainder? It's got to be what? 1 or 2, right? can't be 0 because it's a prime and it's bigger than or equal to 5. You see that? So you can do the same kind of game. You know P and Q have to have a certain form and then just go through this and you should be able to extract a 3. And then you, get, then you get the answer by that corollary. Sorry, I went through this kind of fast, but I didn't really have a choice. Um, in section 2.2, it says um, the three of any odd integers of the form is P plus 1. If mm -hmm. you use that one, it kind of... Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah so... Um, so the square of any odd integers of the form uh, 8k plus 1. Okay, so, um, yeah, so if you, use, if you use that, then you can get the, yeah, you can get the 8 to pop out right away. Yeah, right. Uh, is that something that I assigned to you or not? Yeah, I don't think I assigned that particular problem. Okay, so here's the, here are the, here are the, the rules, okay. Um, if you want to use a previous homework uh, problem, that's okay. But if I haven't assigned it, then you should write a proof it's of it. It's oh, it's in the section. Okay, anything in the section is fair game. Anything in the section is fair game. Even if I didn't do it in class, but you should cite it. You should say by corollary blah, blah, blah. Say, say where it's coming from. Okay? <laughs>